We've got the Kurong Council, Department of Infrastructure and Transport, Primary Industries of South Australia, SA Power Networks and SA Water. So I'd like to thank everyone who has helped to put this night together. It's quite a bit to put together, especially the council. Um, it's an information meeting. So we're also live streaming the event tonight. So if anyone's got any questions, um, you can put them into the live stream and we'll answer them. We'll also take questions at the end of the night. And for people who can't make it tonight, they can look at the, we'll record it and it'll be available on the SES website afterwards. So what we'll do tonight, it's an open form, format. So the speakers will talk first. So we'll ask you to hold your questions until the end. There'll be time at the end for questions. Some of you may you have post-it notes. We've got paper up on the side wall for the different agencies who are represented. If you've got any questions, you're welcome to put them up there. But we'll also have questions from the floor. Um, and if there's questions that we can't answer, because there may be some questions that we can't answer tonight, we'll forward them onto the agencies. Um, tonight, we'd like to encourage you to think about what you can do to keep yourself safe. Um, and we'll cover some things off tonight. And also, if there's people who can't make it, we've got a lot of brochures out in the room out here, so we encourage you to take as many brochures, as much information as a lot for people who can't make it tonight. So I'll start by with uh, the SES, who's Steph, um, and she will start by talking to you um, about what the SES is doing. Thanks, Steph. Thanks, Fiona. Um, well, that's much clearer than before. Uh, as Fiona said, my name's Stephanie. Um, I'm one of the incident controllers for this incident um, and I'm representing the incident management team that's based in Loxton. Um, and my role, I guess, or SES's role is as the control agency for flood. So we are very mindful that it's important to be able to provide you with as much information as we can. Firstly, I just want a um, couple of acknowledgements. One is to all of you who have taken the time to come out tonight and hear the information that we're going to provide to you. I know it's very warm in here, so I appreciate and we were running late, so I appreciate your patience. To the people that are online at the moment, I also appreciate your patience for getting that live streaming up and running. So thank you to everybody that's um, joining us in one way or another today. So as Fiona said, the purpose of this community meeting is to ensure that you are adequately informed um, and to enhance your safety if that's required. What we're hoping to be able to do tonight is provide you with some um, advice for your communities uh, so that you know what's coming. We know that there's been quite a bit of anxiety. I'd like to acknowledge that, um, that the, the communities in the lower lakes have perhaps felt like there hasn't been a lot of information available to you. What we're trying to do is address that today. So what we do know is that the flow at the border um, is currently 131 gigalitres a day. I'm not going to talk too much about the flows and the lake levels and the barrages. We're really lucky that we've got DEW and SA Water here to be able to answer those questions for you and provide you with information on that. Um, but I can tell you that we know, and you would have heard it in the media, that we're expecting two peaks. Um, one at about 175 gigalitres, or that high probability of 175 gigalitres early December, with a possibility of a second peak around that 185-ish um, mark in January, or late December, early January. We know that these are the highest flows that the River Murray has seen since the, since the 70s. Many of you may have well have been around the last time we had flows of this level um, and can remember what that looks like. But equally, there are a number of people in your community who may never have seen this before. So the idea is to try and provide that information for everybody. The challenge too is that since the 70s, there's a lot of differences in the river. A lot of differences in the river system, in the lake system, the channel looks different. So whatever you experienced in 1974 may well be very close to what we see again this time around, but there may be some nuances, some differences with that. And we just want to acknowledge that as well. One of the things that we, we really want to make sure that we address and cover off on is understanding um, the flow rate into the lakes and how the lake's going to be managed so that you feel confident in that, um, in the impacts that you're going to see down here. The other thing that we want to talk about is, um, I guess from an SES point of view, know that regardless of the lake management levels, we know that those storm events, those high wind events, um, the tides, all of those, the duration of the wind as it stays up can still have impacts on that. So 
regardless of the level, whether it stays at current pool level or it extends any bit, you may see those um, fluctuations. The SES is very aware of that. I want to reassure you of that. We're taking that into account when we consider our action plans. We know that we're starting to see a lot of communities upstream already seeing those impacts. You've still got a little bit of lead time before those water levels start to, or the waters start to push through um, down into the lake systems themselves. Uh, like I said, DEW is going to talk about those forecast flow rates and the heights. From an SES point of view, we have that incident management team that's based in Loxton at the moment. Despite its location, please rest assured we are making sure that we're looking at the river and the lower lakes as a complete system. So we're working from border all the way through to the Murray Mouth. Um, we also um, are part of a zone emergency support team. That's a team of multi-agency representatives from all of the councils, um, SAPOL, SAS, all the emergency services, and a number of other government and non-government providers. We meet weekly, and that's to ensure that we're actually all on the same page. The State Emergency Centre, so the next level up, is also meeting on and briefing on a weekly basis. That's a collection of all government agencies and non-government agencies coming together at a state level to make sure that we're having a coordinated government approach to this. We've been working very closely with councils, Department of Infrastructure and Transport, SA Water, DEW, for months. We've been in place since August and we've been working through the changing forecasts and what that means for you and your communities as we go. I think one of the key things SES has been trying to do is work really closely with DEW to understand those flood forecasts. So every time we see a forecast change, um, which is very much dependent on what's happening in the eastern states, um, we are making sure that we go back and we review the flood data that we have available to us, the impact data, the historical data. We're talking to communities, understanding what you've seen in the past, having a look at the property data that goes with that. Every time we see that new forecast, we go back and we review our plans. So I want to reassure you from a, um, in terms of being able to provide you with a level of confidence, every time that data changes, every week we're looking at it and we're making sure that we're capturing as much information as we can. From an alerts and warnings perspective, um, I get uh, I'm very much aware, I think, that this is probably a bit of confusion for the communities in the lower lakes. Um, at the moment, we have a watch and act that's in place for the upper Murray and for the lower Murray, um, but it stops at Wellington. And we, I appreciate that perhaps there's some confusion as to why that occurs. So the watch and act is for moderate flood levels along the length of the river proper. Um, but I think I wanted to reassure you that the reason there is no current warning in place for the lakes, uh, the lower lake area, is because none of the forecasts or data that we've been provided to date mean that we meet triggers for minor flood warning. So rest assured that's the reason why there is no warning in place. It's not that we've forgotten you. It's just that you don't actually meet the trigger for a minor flood at this point. You're going to hear a lot of information tonight. There are a lot of speakers. Um, they all have some really valuable information to provide you. We all have different websites, different social media platforms, different phone numbers. If you remember one for me, can you remember sa.gov.au? That's a all of government um, website that's collected everybody else's websites and put that together. So you just have to remember one and then that you can find your information from there. It'll redirect you to every site as we need to. Having said that, uh, one of the best ways that you can fo um, follow the up-to-date information is on SES's um, social media platforms. We're um, publicising our warnings on there. There's community updates that go out on there. If there's a community newsletter that's going out, we're putting, pushing it out. That's one of the quickest ways we can get the information to you, but that will also be found on that sa.gov.au site as well. Sandbagging um, is one thing that we have been working very, very hard, striving very hard to make sure that we are providing adequate resources to communities. Um, there are six strategically located sandbag locations at the moment. Most of them placed upstream up the river. The closest one to you is Murray Bridge. And part of that is, again, because there's been identified that there isn't a huge amount of um, risk that would require sandbagging. Uh, as we move forward, though, we will continue to monitor that. If something changes, we'll make sure that we're moving our sandbagging resources appropriately. 
If you do have a need to go and get them, like I said, your closest one is at Murray Bridge. That's open seven days a week between nine and three. And you can get sandbags from there as well as um, frequently asked questions. There'll be SES representatives on site. They can help you, show you how to prepare your home. What is um, effective sandbagging? So for some communities, we're finding that building a two metre high sandbagging wall perhaps isn't the most effective use of those sandbags, where it is, you, depending on where your property is and the water flow through. So talking to somebody from the SES about the best way to prepare your home, you can do that at those locations. What we're asking you to do as residents um, is being able to be aware of what your risk is. It's one of the best things you can do to make sure that you stay prepared. So what is your risk? Um, know what your risk is. Have a look at the flood mapping and modelling that's available. There are several links on the web at the moment where you can find that information. You can drill down and zoom into your house to work out where your property is. Understand how to sandbag effectively, like I said, sandbagging doors, vents, um, drains, lifting objects off the ground. If you feel like you're going to have some inundation, make sure you're lifting um, all of your property up off of floor level. What is safe water use? I'm probably preaching to the converted because I assume there are an awful lot of bodies in this room, but we're asking people to make sure that they're operating within their skill set. So maintaining your safety whilst on a vessel. Um, don't operate it if you feel that the environment is unsafe to do so. Make sure that you're wearing the appropriate protective equipment. Um, and that you're operating within. So if you do happen to be operating on the river itself, remembering that we've got that four knot limit around um, properties. Again, if you're on the river or on, indeed on the lake, being aware of debris or submerged objects. If you see a road closure sign, we're asking people to adhere to that. Um, just because you might not see water on the road doesn't mean that the water isn't coming up to the sides of the road and perhaps making the edges of that quite soft. I know that um, Dee are going to talk a little bit more about that as well. The other part that's really important that SES want to talk to you about, and again, bearing in mind, so right at the beginning, I talked about the fact that you have a very, very low risk indicated here. They're very confident in the way that the water levels are being managed and therefore the risk to properties is low. However, what I do want you to consider if you're from elsewhere and not perhaps on the lower lakes is considering your own personal circumstances around whether you're going to stay in your property or not. And there's lots of different things you need to think about your own personal um, circumstances, medical, social, financial, all those kinds of things. If you're choosing to stay and you become isolated, um, how are you going to get out of that situation? If you're choosing to stay and you've told people and then change your mind, make sure that you tell people that as well because we wouldn't want anybody to think that you're unaccounted for in some way. Keep up to date with the warnings. I think that's probably the biggest piece of information I can give you. The messages from SES, we're pushing out as much information as we can for you. The warnings and the community updates and community newsletters that are coming out are trying to give as much information as possible. Maintain a watch on that sa.gov.au site. You can monitor those road closures on Traffic SA. We ask that people don't drive through floodwaters and undertake that river use within your capabilities. I think one of the hardest things coming into summer is asking people not to let children play in floodwaters. Unfortunately, it's getting warmer. The water is very enticing. It's beautiful outside at the moment. Um, but we ask that if you're in a flood area where those waters are moving very quickly, that you would be mindful of um, who is entering the water and their safety as well. From an SES point of view and our crew point of view, we're working very hard to make sure that we're here for you as a community, but the other thing that we need to be mindful of is our crew safety as well. So that's why some of these actions that we're asking of you are actually going to end up helping our crews as well because that won't put them in areas of risk if they're trying to rescue you from a risky space. Um, if you do have an SES crew responding to your location and you're aware of an emergency hazard, please let them know when you call. And you can always call SES on 132 500 for any kind of uh, flood or storm response. Um, but just make sure that you're notifying them if there are access issues due to um, roads cut off or if there's any downed lines or those sorts of things. 
like I said, we're going to hand over now to um, all the other speakers that you see in front of us. They have some really important information to be able to share with you. Hold your questions to the end if you can. I'm hoping that as we go that we'll be able to answer all of them before you have to ask them. Um, but by all means, please ask afterwards. The other um, services that we have in the room, and I know we've got some locals, but we've got um, SAS represented as well as SAPOL. So, um, and, and we've got some really good um, representatives on the panel tonight. So fingers crossed we'll be able to answer everything for you, but please um, take this information as it comes to you. Thank you. Thanks, Steph. Some great information there. The next person we've got is Chrissy from the Department of Environment and Water. Thanks, Chrissy. Uh, good evening. I said my name's Christy Bloss. I'm the manager of River Murray Water Delivery in the Department for Environment and Water. My day job is usually uh, managing uh, the River Murray water levels, flows, uh, lower lakes, barrage releases and the like with, um, in partnership with SA Water for the lower lakes and talking a lot to our upstream agencies, Murray Basin Authority uh, and other states uh, about the delivery of River Murray flow to South Australia, but uh, now we're in a flood now, things are getting a bit interesting. I wanted to start out by talking about uh, the forecast now. Uh, as Steph mentioned, our current forecast is that we're going to get a flow of around 175 gig a day in early December, and then later December, and this is at the, at the border, up to around 185, maybe as high as 200 uh, at the border uh, later in December. Uh, down here, about a three-week travel time to get down here. Um, we do tend to relate to the size of our flood in South Australia by the flow. I know that can be a bit confusing for people. Uh, if you'd if, uh, apart from the lakes here where we, we think we're going to stay fairly constant, for everyone else who lives other parts of the rivers, if you want to relate that flow forecast to the river height where you are, the Department for Environment and Water publishes a flow report every Friday, as well as other information on the website, you can get to it via that sa.gov.au website, where for most towns, well, a lot of localities on the river, all the towns and plus some more, you can look at the flow and go, OK, well, uh, normal water level, pool level is this, and we're, gonna and we're forecasting that the river is going to get to this high. So you can see if the river level is going to rise by six metres or seven, eight metres, whatever that is, by looking at those tables of uh, forecast uh, river levels that's uh, on, on our on the government websites. Um, put the flow into context. So we're saying 175 up to 185, maybe closer to 200 by the end of the end of the year. Uh, the 1974 flood was 182 gig at the border. Um, the 1975 flood was about 162. So we're looking at the 1970s floods and a bit higher. But as Steph said before, that was. 40 plus years ago, so things might change. Also to note that the, uh, there's no major tributaries in South Australia, so if we have 180 gig measured, 180 gigalitres per day measured at the border, what will tend to happen is that will reduce slightly on the way down because there aren't any more big rivers coming in. So 180 gig at the border might be 170, 160 by the time it gets to lock one. To address some of the, I guess, concerns about the fact the forecast has changed a number of times, and I admit it's not ideal, and it did take us by surprise. Everyone by surprise as well. Uh, it's very easy to look on the, uh, on the news and see uh, flooding uh, in all parts of New South Wales and Victoria and go, oh, well, of course it's going to flood here. A lot of those areas, particularly in northern New South Wales, that water is going to take months and months, four or five months, to get to South Australia. In many cases, a really big flow at the top of those catchments will reduce to like 10% of that by the time it gets to the bottom. So, for example, uh, the Murrumbidgee, they had a, a, a discharge from one of their dams of, say, you know, 200 gig a day. We, we've now got like 30 or 40 at the bottom. It reduces way down, and how they interact as well is very complicated. We've, it's been a wet couple of years, but it had been steady for a long time. No big flood. No one big flood in the upper Murray that was going to cause a flood for us, and so... We've had these elevated flows in the river since about July last year, unregged flows. Um, it wasn't until the big flood events in Victoria in the middle of October when Shepparton and Seymour and those kind of places flooded, big inflows from the uh, Goulburn and the Ovens rivers and Campaspe, as well as flows from you know, right at the very top from the, from the Hume Dam, places like that, that we suddenly 
saw we're going to have a flood situation on our hands. There's a part of the River Murray between New South Wales and Victoria where there's multiple channels. The main channel in the Murray now is not just the same channel it's been using for all of time. There's these other historical channels. And what happened when all that water came down from the Goulburn and Ovens rivers, it hit part of the Murray channel and it's, got, it's constrained in size. And all that water pushed out over the floodplain and went overland. And it's really hard to measure what that flow is when it's just filling up people's paddocks. And so there was a period of time there where we didn't actually know really what the flow was going to be. And it wasn't until it comes further downstream and it all joins back up together again that we've got a better handle of what that flow is going to be. And so it's only in the last week or so that some of those river gauging sites have started to peak downstream of the Edward Wakul system, which is kind of that big floodplain area you know, near Echuca and Daniloquin, that kind of area. They've come back together now and now we've got some better confidence in what the flow is going to be. And so when we talk about that first peak early December, that's from the, the, the flooding that hit uh, Shepparton and Echuca and things like that, reaching us, reaching the border in early December. However, a few weeks later, another big rain event and Hume Dam had the biggest release since 1992. So that water's charging its way down now as well. It's also now in that grey area of the Edward Cool system. So that's why there's this bit of uncertainty still in late December because what's going to happen to that water? It won't behave the same way as the first peak because it's coming into floodplains that are already full of water. It's probably going to move faster. We don't quite know yet. It's really hard to measure the water in that part of the river across those floodplains. If you look on the satellite, there's just loads of water everywhere. You might have seen the, the Facebook pictures of like hay plains, just water everywhere. Same with water coming in the Murrumbidgee, water everywhere. So until all that water starts getting back in the main channel, it's going to be really, really difficult to really pin down what that peak will be. But we're doing our best and we're trying to give that range of confidence so that people can at least sort of plan a bit higher. Like we don't want to wait until we're certain because then you lose weeks of prep time. Um, always giving that early advice of what we think is going to be the range, plan that just in case level, and then we'll keep updating as we go along as that peak gets closer. Um, so I have mentioned that, um, give advice on the forecast at the, at the border, a lot of our information relates to that. Uh, we have tables in the flow report about water levels at different locations that relates to that flow. We also have flood mapping for locations along the river that also relate to those flows. And so for people who, who live a bit further upriver, it goes as far south, it goes as far downstream as, as Wellington. People can look at those maps and make a guess, make a a judgment on whether or not they may be impacted by flooding, noting the four, they're, they're models, they're not, they can't always represent exactly reality, but they're a, a, a useful tool to give uh, an informed judgment of if someone would be flood prone or not, or if your property is flood prone or not. Always will be things that change. So for example, the model might, um, you know, it, it can't foresee what someone's going to do. Someone might fill up that low spot in the levee and then it won't flood behind that levee, for example. Has to, is a point in time estimate. So they're a useful tool, but they're not exact. Don't go zooming in this far and go, oh, they're a broad um, indication of where the water will go. Um, I would have normally talked more about the lower lakes management, but Gary Fife is here and, and he's the, uh, the resident expert, so all the hard questions go to Gary. But I will say this is that. We have been in constant, we, we, well, we talk to SA Water nearly every day anyway about the lower lakes and barrages, but ever since the flows picked up, we have been talking to SA Water a lot about how this flow can be passed through the lakes. And the answer is still the same, even with the increasing forecast, that the barrages have capacity to pass this kind of flow. There are the barrages, there's also overland flow paths. And so we believe that we can manage average lake levels to below that one mid AHD. Now, if you think, that our usual operating range of the lakes is up to about 0.85 average. A little bit of wiggle room in there, but below one. And even the, the, the floods that came through in the 70s didn't go above an average lake level of one metre AHD, and Gary's got some more info on that as well. The only f time that the lakes flooded that we're aware of is in 1956. That was 341 giga a day compared to the under 200 that we're talking about. So that was a much bigger flood. Uh, we, we, for that reason is why uh, there isn't a flood warning out for the lower lakes and uh, there isn't flood maps for the lower lakes is because we think we can keep you 
in that normal range. It's not to say that you might not have a big wind event come up and whip up the water on one side of the lakes locally and get those elevated water levels. But that's the same kind of risk that you face normally anyway, because we know that at times wind events come through and push all the water at one end and comes back again the other way. We are hoping, though, that this uh, lot of water coming through the lakes will provide a really good opportunity to freshen Lake Albert. And we have already seen the salinity in Lake Albert drop quite a bit. It was set up around 1800 EC a few months back. Last time it looked, just, just now, it's down under 1,960 EC for average EC in, um, in Lake Albert. So that's really, really good. It's a good outcome to get this flow down. We will try to keep the lake levels down as much as possible. But we've got a few constraints at the moment because the downstream water levels are quite high. But as we keep trying to pull that lake level down, that's going to have a great freshening effect for Lake Albert because it's almost like a, a cycling, if you like. We'll keep pulling the water out when we can, and the more water will come in, and we'll pull it out again. So uh, we really do hope that by the end of this, uh, this flood event that we can have some good um, water quality outcomes for Lake Albert, at least. Might leave it there, um, but yeah, there's, if there's any uh, thing I haven't addressed or Gary doesn't get to, then... Uh, Happy to answer later on. Thanks. Thanks, Chrissy. The next person we have speaking is Matt James from the Coorong Council. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Fiona. Um, so, yeah, my name is Matt James. I'm Director of Roads and Infrastructure at the Council. Um, uh, what I'm here today to do is tell you about what we have been doing in the background to prepare for the the, the flood event and um, and to keep the community safe. I guess that's always council's um, you know focus is to keep the community safe, advocate for the community, and make sure that we're um, providing you as much information as we can. So, council is involved in the ZEST, which is a zone emergency um, support team, which encompasses all the agencies and all the upstream councils that are involved in this event. So the benefit that we have is that we're learning from our neighbours as the water flows down. So we have that advantage of knowing what's coming. Um, a lot of the other councils don't have that and some of our Riverland neighbours are, are doing it pretty tough at the moment. So spare a thought for them, we've got that three to four week buffer for the water to come down. Um, so what council are doing is we've developed a, a pretty detailed risk management um, framework which is staged and the staging is based on the flow rates as they reach the border. So we've got that three to four week period of, of preparation time where we can start to look at our, um, our responses to, to what's coming. Uh, um, some of the things that we're, we're working on is um, survey work. So we're doing a lot of survey of our existing infrastructure just so we can get a good correlation about the predicted flow height or the predicted standing water height and what our infrastructure stands at. So we can look at freeboard, things like that. So we understand if there is a wind event, what may be at jeopardy. So it's not just the flat water event, it's when the wind does blow. So we've been looking at a 400 to 500 mil freeboard um, to allow for that if it, um, if it does eventuate. Uh, we're looking at um, a staged closing process of um, waterfront reserves if necessary. Um, that closure program is based on risk and criticality. So we're looking at less high, or high use and, um, and high importance reserves such as um, Lions Park or Dixon's Reserve at, um, at, at um, Tail and Bend will be closed as late as possible. Some of the lower use um, reserves will be closed earlier. Well, um, you know, from a resourcing point of view, we can't close everything on the same day. So we're going to have a staged approach um, to our closures. Floating infrastructure and jetties, um, such as the, the jetty at, um, at uh, the sailing club and some of the other floating infrastructure that we've got, in particular the one at Dixon's Reserve at Tail and Bend and at Wellington Marina, um, we will remove the gangways because they are at risk of damage if the water level does come up. They will jam and cause um, some problems. So we're looking at removing those when the water um, at the border reaches 165. So we're actually preparing for do that. We'll need a contractor to assist us in that with a crane. So that's, um, that's in train. Uh, things like fixed jetties, we're looking at placing um, hazard buoys on the end of those jetties. So if they are submerged, they will be um, able to be seen through a buoy on a rope. Um, or closing and also closing the jetty at the landing um, to make sure people don't head out to the to the end of the jetty and, and get in trouble. Um, some of the more, I guess, 
important things that council need to address is the service or the provision of services, in particular CWMS or sewer, um, provision of non-potable water and stormwater. Um, one of the risks that we have here in, in uh, Meningi in particular is if we have a high river or high lake event and a stormwater event at the same time. So we've got pumps on standby to evacuate water from basins. I know it's pushing water into the lake and it's, you know, going to the toilet in the ocean, let's say. Um, we do have provisions to block stormwater drainage to stop egress coming in from the lake into the stormwater basins. It is, um, it is going to be a challenge if that does eventuate, but we do have a plan to um, do sandbagging, um, pumps, etc. CWMS, um, obviously there's some challenges with getting trucks, you know, pump trucks from Murray Bridge, Manham, etc., where we historically have been getting them from. They're all very busy at the moment, obviously, with the problems they're having upstream. So we've organised um, trucks to be on standby from the southeast places like Kingston, Tatiara Council, and and whatnot to assist us if CWMS is disconnected through power outage. We can evacuate our systems um, if that if that occurs. Um, the other um, provision of, of service that we do have in this area is the non-potable water scheme at uh, Wellington that has um, had some challenges in the coming previous weeks and will continue to do so, mainly due to the water quality from the river. So as that's not a treated system, it's water that comes directly from the lake and distributed to either the Wellington East Marina, the water quality is, um, is not going to be fantastic um, and we're looking at if it gets to a point of, of needing to cease that service, then we'll look at trucking water in um, through a, a, a secondary source, it might mean that we have to use a SA water standpipe to, dis, dis, to, um, to, to support that service. If that did occur, we'd be looking at putting in water restrictions or similar to, um, to only for you know, critical use or domestic use. Um, we are also looking at relocating the Wellington East um, extraction point, which is currently in the river. Um, not because that particular point will be um, underwater, the access to it will be. So we won't be able to access that service if it does break down. So we're looking at a temporary location somewhere in the marina that will enable us to um, provide um, water to that community. Um, obviously, um, we're working with DIT in regards to some road closures, and I'm sure Tony will talk about that in, in a minute. Um, we don't believe that any of our road infrastructure is at risk at this point in time. Um, we may have some minor inundation if we have a significant wind on parts of Narung Road and Poltalic Road, but that is um, a very low risk. Um, that's probably about it, and I'm happy to take questions at the end, um, but if you have other questions um, going forward, um, just ring the council, ask for myself. Um, I'm council's contact for this uh, event, and um, I'm happy to help um, as best I can. Um, but you know, I guess what we are encouraging our community to do is make sure that we are keeping abreast of all the accurate information that's being provided by all the other agencies and making sure that um, you know, we're, we're listening to the, the, I guess, the detailed information that's being provided in particular by the SES and due. Uh, the other thing um, as well is that um, we do need to um, make sure that we keep our minds um, open to, to looking at risks and making sure that we're communicating those risks. If not to the lead agencies, make sure you, you, you don't, you're not scared to call council because we are here to help and we are here to advocate for you. So, thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, the next person we've got is Tony from the Department of Infrastructure and Transport. Thanks, Tony. Hello. So my name is Tony Scarlett and my role is the Stakeholder Engagement Coordinator for Regional South within Road Maintenance and I'm based out at Murray Bridge. <clears throat> I'll be giving you a brief overview of the impacts of this event of ferries, marine safety and state roads today. So our department has been working hard on planning ahead to ensure that the roads, ferries and marine environment continues to be a safe place for the community. I'll start with ferries and can advise that some of our ferries may need to close as the water level rises over the highest landing point. Our marine team will be taking regular measurements to make sure we are timing the closing and the reopening of ferries with the safety of both the public and the ferry operators in mind at all times. 
Ferries likely to need to close in the next week or so include Morgan and Lirrup. In the coming weeks, the Manham, Swan Reach, Walker Flat and Pernong ferries will be at risk of closure as the river rises over their highest landing points. Our marine team are doing their best to ensure the ferries are kept running safely as long as possible and are keeping communities informed. A number of the ferries may close if the roads leading to them becomes inundated. This includes the Taylor Bend, Wellington and Narang ferries. Communications about ferry closures and the detour routes will be made via social media and also on our website at dit.sa.gov.au, which is linked to the sa.gov.au. We have a dedicated page for ferry locations and operational status, and it's kept up to date every day. All closures will have appropriate signage and detour routes provided where applicable. The closures will also be posted on our Traffic SA website at trafficsa.gov.au once they're in place. In regards to activities on the river and waterways, the Marine Safety Team ask all users of the Murray River to slow your speed and don't go out if the conditions are hazardous. River users need to watch for hazards in the water due to the high flows, keeping in mind that some fixtures, such as jetties and pontoons, may now be underwater where you can't see them. There's a list of marine hazards and boat ramp closures on the Marine Safety website. Vessel restrictions were announced this week and apply to any part of the River Murray, including all, including all creeks, tri tributaries, lagoons and other bodies of water connected to the River Murray between the South Australian border and through to the ferry landings at Wellington. So those restrictions don't come down this far. They stop at Wellington. The restrictions aim to keep river users safe and protect infrastructure and include a four-knot speed limit, which is commonly referred to as a fast walking speed, for any vessels operating within 250 metres of any property partially or fully submerged and within 250 metres of any levee partially or fully submerged. The four-knot limit also <laughs> also applies to vessels operating at night or in restricted visibility. In addition, all personal watercraft, commonly referred to as jet skis, must not exceed four knots on any part of the River Murray from the SA border to the Wellington, uh, to the Wellington ferry landings. There is also to be no swimming, bathing or diving within 250 metres of a lock or weir and no operating unpowered vessels within 250 metres of a lock or weir, which includes canoes, kayaks, surf skis, rowboats, or any other human-powered vessels or aquatic toys. Vessel operators on vessels 12 metres and under are required to ensure that all passengers on board wear a level 50 or above life jacket while underway or at anchor. Our marine safety team have been carefully marking out hazards on the water with signage and yellow buoys, and we encourage river users to report any hazards to our marine safety team through our report form on our website. The best way to find the marine safety information is to Google marine safety, and it's the first link on the return search list. Now, the marine safety team haven't come down to the lower lakes yet um, because there hasn't been the flows we've been focusing on the Riverland and down to the Mid Murray. Um, but you can still report any risks because they are heading this way. Now onto the roads. The road maintenance team have assessed which state roads are likely to be subject to flooding and what detours will be appropriate. These detours have been posted on our website and are available to view now. We have placed restrictions on Book Padong Road between Berry and Loxton as the water is getting close to the road there. We've also closed Morgan Road today um, near Barmer due to some levee works the council is doing for Lake Bonnie. We're monitoring the other roads at risk and are doing our best to keep them open as long as possible while maintaining public safety. Remember, it's not safe to drive into floodwaters at any time, and if members of the public come across any dangers on the road, including floodwaters, they can be reported 24-7 to the Traffic Management Centre on 1800 018 313. Any road closures will be posted to social media and updated on the Traffic SA website. Our DIT website is being kept up to date every day with any changes, and I have a fact sheet available on the table out there with all the details of the web pages and the phone numbers that I've mentioned. You can also find all of our links on the dedicated page at sa.gov.au. Thank you.
Thanks, Tony. Next we have Bob from the Parham Industries of SA. I'm the small one. Hi everyone. Um, Primary Industries um, and Regions is also part of all the different emergency management groups that have been spoken about tonight. So uh, just be mindful that we're we're feeding in at all those levels, and we also have our own internal um, uh, working group, which is basically uh, representatives from all of our different units uh, coming together once a week to identify any new or pending issues. Um, my role within primary industries and regions is regional coordinator for the Riverland and Murray Lands. So my work stretched from, from Remark to here. And um, I also live in regions, so a part of what's going on on a daily basis. Um, the unit, we, PERSA have done a whole lot of mapping as with every other agency. And um, we've looked at inundation up to and above the predicted levels um, that we have and we're quietly confident that we're aware of uh, where our areas of concern might be. And uh, once again, with the lower lakes at this point in time, we don't have a lot of um, concern, but if there are any areas that people think we don't know about, please come and tell me. Um, we also have our normal roles. A lot of them don't... Um, uh, have any bearing down here, but we still have um, 16 active fruit fly outbreaks in the Riverland, so we'll still be working to get that under control. And we also are looking at the Varroa issue and monitoring what's going on interstate, restricting, access, restricting bee movement and a whole lot of the normal work there. Japanese and cephalitis, uh, we encourage everybody to go and get their vaccinations who live on the river, and that is free for anyone in a river community. We also are monitoring foot and mouth, <laughs> so all the good stuff. Um, our primary responsibility also is around livestock, and um, so we, we're the notification point. If anyone sees or hears of any stranded or unkept livestock in the coming um, you know, situation, we, we will follow that up, and we're working closely with both animal welfare and RSPCA. Um, we also have, um, uh, I'll leave that one to last because that's a good one. Uh, <laughs> it's just all good news. Um, look, I know that uh, there'll be a lot of people that live through the 74 uh, flood event and also, dare I mention it, the millennium drought. And um, everybody will understand that with that, there is potential for fish kills where we're hoping that um, blackwater events will be uh, limited, but we do know when water recedes, fish get stuck. PERSA is actually responsible for the clean-up operations and have already actually taken that uh, little bit of argy-bargy that normally goes on between council and um, government, and we've got full responsibility at this stage. We've set up a management plan for that, and for all of you in the room, you should be really comfortable in knowing that we're talking to your local fishers and a few others to make sure that they get taken out of the system as soon as possible. We're also working with a number of agencies and or not government agencies, but other organisations for composting and removal. So hopefully when that does happen, when there's any major fish kills, we've got that under control. Uh, we also have uh, our farm and business mentors. So if there's any farm or business people that feel that they're going to be affected in any way or just want to talk about it, because a lot of it is not knowing and not knowing who to talk to and feeling like you're having the same conversation multiple times. We have three fab mentors in our region and they're all amazing. So uh, their details are also uh, linked to the sa.gov.au website and as of next week they'll start to do more of the community events as well. And the good one, we um, uh, were part of the Premier's um, uh, release, uh, funding release the other day, so if uh, we will be supporting the, the grant program for primary industries. So um, if there is anyone that is affected um, and uh, when the guidelines come out, give us a call. And once again, check out sa.gov.au. Thanks, Barb. Um, as Barb mentioned, there is some information about Japanese encephalitis out on the tables. So there's a brochure 
And there's also some an information sheet about it, so I'd encourage people to have a look at that. The next person we've got up is Trevor from SA Power Networks. Thanks, Trevor. Thank you, Fiona. Uh, my name is Trevor Gregory from SA Power Networks. Um, just like to reiterate that this is a live event for SA Power Networks, as our network obviously ref um, extends from the Victoria border up near Randmark right through this region. Um, SA Power Networks is actively involved, a key stakeholder of all the, with all the other authorities um, in receiving the latest up-to-date information and the coordination of the planning of this event. Um, like everyone's mentioned earlier, our safety is our priority. Um, there is no mixture between electricity and power. Uh, the risks that, are, that we uh, are managing is reduced clearances uh, to our power lines um, through flood, flooded backwaters and the like, um, inundated underground assets, and also the access for our workers. So um, in some cases, we we, will, we may have to forecast and disconnect, hopefully, before floods get there so that we can um, have safe access to, to disconnect um, future undated uh, networks. Um, we do recognise uh, that we do provide a central service to South Australia in the form of providing power to people's businesses and homes. So we do have a, a key, a key uh, a balance with safety and also keeping people's power on as long as we can. Um, we're very conscious of that, but like I say, safety is number one. Um, we have in, we've, in, we've been prior to the uh, leading into the front flood event as uh, we were receiving forecasts from other authorities, was proactively inspecting our networks with uh, helicopters, drones and the like. Um, in recent times that's uh, transferred unfortunately to inspecting our, our networks from boats. So we're out there in the uh, managing the event as a, as a live event, um, like many of the other agencies. Uh, we have implemented um, measures to s strengthen the uh, or re reduce risk of our, some of our key assets. Um, you would have may have seen on the news that we've undertaken um, extra bunding work around the Renmark substation, so um, based on forecasts from the um, from Department of Environment and Water, um, we've taken undertaken extra measures to to bund uh, that, that risk that we identified. We're responding to um, the event with extra technical people in the field. Um, that gives the uh, community the, the ability, of irrigators and the like, to get access to people in the field that can get out to those, uh, those customers and uh, get any advice on how we may be able to help them with um, you know, assessing risk and the like. People are being uh, very proactive and asking for disconnections. Um, there's lots of uh, customers ringing in for disconnections and proactive measures happening throughout the community, which is, um, is also supported by SA Power Networks in streamlining our processes um, to enable those quick disconnections. Communications is key. Um, like I said, we're, we're continually in, engaged with all of the uh, regulatory, uh, other government authorities. Um, we're, we're part of the ZEST meetings and, and the state emergency meetings. Um, we receive our updates on Thursdays and, and reflect all that uh, information into our, into our modelling and planning. Um, we've invoked all of our internal um, emergency response plans. Um, we do update our website um, and has been tailored recently to, to, uh, to address the um, timely, accurate information on our, on our website. So I encourage you to go into the website and have a look, sapadnetworks.com.au. Um, and there's also an opportunity in there to register for SMS messaging. Our key for us is to keep the, the community, uh, community informed with, with uh, latest updates and risks. So please, it's, it's a two minute exercise if you've if you've got the uh, access to the technology, please go in if you haven't and register for um, the, uh, SMS messaging and it'll be there forever for power outages or anything. So it's a, it's a key message, a key way for us to communicate with the, with the community. So um, it's heartening to say that things may, uh, oh sorry, looking stable down here, 
Um, but we are continually uh, in contact with all authorities to, uh, to keep up to date uh, and reflect and understand how those risks relate to our network and keeping the community safe. So that's, um, there's a brochure on the table um, as at the entrance. We encourage you to take them. Um, but like I said, any, um, any updates, you can call our customer and community centre number on 13 12 61. They're, uh, they can take all calls. If there's an emergency, don't hesitate, 13 13 66. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll be continue updating um, our involvement in the flood um, as we know more. Thank you. Thanks, Trevor. Next, we have Gary from SA Water. Thanks, Gary. I can see everyone's hot, so I'm going to try and be really, really brief and crack into it really easy. Got two things to really say. One is about drinking water. Um, SA Water's got a number of drinking water plants um, here and upriver, and we've been working probably for about three months or so to really look at all of those sites, make sure they're protected, make sure they've got levee banks around them. We've been talking with SA Power Networks, make sure we're going to have power. If we don't have that, we'll have emergency backup behind them. We're pretty confident at this stage that we've got our drinking water systems organised, so all going well, we should be good from that, from that regard. And the other part is the barrages. I suppose the main thing about the barrages is that it's not actually their first rodeo. So what I grabbed out of our office was the 1974 diaries, which are kept, we keep all of our old diaries and bits and pieces. And what it shows is that the barrages can handle the flow that we've got coming at us at the moment without any great drama. For the last month or so, we've been trying our best, given the tides and winds, to, max, to match what comes in goes out. We're slowly getting to a point now where we can no longer equally prevent uh, the tide from beating us on some days, so we're very close to pulling every single gate out, which is pretty consistent with what happened in the 1974 flood. We've been watching these diaries and what happened previously. Sometime next week, we will have absolutely every single gate out and the barrages will no longer be any impediment to flow at all. It'll then be through the mouth. What we're seeing at the mouth at the moment is quite a, quite a constrained mouth, but this week the dredge operators who are still down there working uh, on other activities reported that um, they had to re-anchor their dredge barges because the flow going out the mouth was very hard to hold on to this week. So we're now starting to see some really good velocity stripping water and sand out of the mouth. So we're starting to see the natural processes come into play where the amount of water we've got coming in is more than what the Southern Ocean is dealing to us and we'll start to see the mouth probably widen out and it'll start to effectively uh, reduce the flow in, in, uh, in, in the constraint that the mouth's currently giving us. So we're reasonably confident at this stage that we should be able to maintain below the one metre. And as Chrissy and everybody else has indicated already, the key thing will be wind and tide. If we get some really big tides, it will create localised issues. Our first response to that, which you'll probably see pretty rapidly, is we'll probably close gates at both Tewitchery and Goolwa. That will reduce the amount of water coming back and hopefully will reduce some impact of that tide for a brief period of time. Normally it's somewhere between 24 and 48 hours. We will roll the dice on making sure that we don't impact the capacity to export water, but we'll try to protect the local community where we possibly can. So that will be one impact, and wind is the other one. Everybody here knows that far more than I do. If we get the wrong wind, we can gain 200 to 300 mils in the lake pretty quickly. There's not a lot that we can do about that particular aspect, apart from try to keep the lake as low as possible. That's what we're going to be doing from now until, as Chrissy said, March, probably, when we start to see flows get right back down to what we would call somewhat normal. And I'm really, really good on questions. So if you've got any questions afterwards, I'll be somewhere over here happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Gary. That brings to the end our speakers. So what we'll do now, we'll open up the floor for questions. We've got two people with roving mics. We've got Vicky and Di. So if you've got a question, can you please put up your hand? We'll bring the mic to you. If we could have one question at a time, if you could stand up so that everyone can hear your questions. So over to you. Hello. Um, I've had a number of people asking me what I, whether I know the answers, so I'll ask you guys. Um, 
Is their access likely to be restricted on the road through the swamps towards the Asheville Hills? <laughs> Could you tell me what the road is called? <laughs> oh, OK. That's useful. <laughs> We're not expecting any impacts to that road at all at this stage, um, but we are monitoring everything. So um, if people are seeing the water come up higher, please tell us, but we've got people running up and down monitoring all of the areas, but the mapping isn't showing anything to give us any concern. Um, which cause, where's that causeway? On the Princess Highway? Yep. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. I'll take that on note and I'll go back and we'll check our mapping. Okay. Yep. Thank you for that. I'll take that back. Right. No. Okay. Thank you. I'll take that back and we'll get that looked at. Yep. Thank you. You're right, Fiona. Um, yeah, it's at Andrew Dawes. I live on Hyde Avenue. Um, I've been watching the water level of the lake over the last. Well, I watch it all the time, to be honest. And. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> SA Water have done a pretty good job. You can see the fluctuation in levels uh, and they're obviously um, getting the water out through the mouth. Um, one of the concerns I have is when I've heard Matt from Kurong District Council and SA Water talk about um, the, the action of the, way, uh, the, the wind on Lake Albert now, I think Matt might have mentioned a figure of 400 millimetres and uh, SA Waterman was something less than that. In my honest opinion, I think you can, you can almost double the wind effect of in, in terms of height, not so much from a level point of view, but the top of the wave, when it hits the shore, the wave keeps going. And, um, and, I, and I think you can, you can probably double those figures. Um, but um, I, I don't think we're going to have a lot of trouble, to be honest, with this one, so I think it's all pretty good. The Kurong, my second question is to the Kurong District Council. I noticed Swamp 333 out here, out the side of um, the school, has got a lot of water in it, and I think Faulkner Street went underwater a week or two ago. I just wonder whether we should be getting some of that water out, if we can, out of that swamp so we've got a bit of a buffer um, should we get another rain event. Um, I, think, I think the drain coming out of there might be blocked off at the moment, but um, I, I think perhaps we might need to do a bit of maintenance there. And I don't know how our gross pollutant traps are situated, but maybe they need a bit of attention. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Did you want to... um, yeah, thanks for that question. Uh, absolutely, totally agree, and that's part of our plan. We're looking at... Um, we've done some levels around the lake and the drain that runs up... I can't even remember the street name, sorry, but... Sorry? Selby Road. Selby Road. Um, but also the, the stormwater infrastructure in the ground. Um, we're looking at potentially putting a small weir in the channel um, to hold water, which we can then pump out, which will then leave, provide that head pressure to push it out through the, the, um, the drain into the lake while the levels are still low. Thank you. We've also got Nick McBride, the member for MacKillop, here in the audience, and also um, the Mayor of Coorong, Paul Simmons. So if you've got any questions for those also, they're happy to answer questions. <laughs> Just while there's a, a break in questions, we've had a question from William um, who's on the live stream and he is asking, and I'm not sure if it's a question or a comment, but why did New South Wales hold the floodwaters back at Balranald since March the river has been held at flood point? 
he doesn't understand why they wouldn't have wanted to release such water before this stage. I'm not sure if anybody could provide a response. Thank you, Chrissy. Uh, I wouldn't say that New South Wales has hold, held the water back. It's pretty wide floodplain at the bottom end of the Murrumbidgee and not far from that where the Lachlan comes down as well. There's some weirs there. They're not holding it back. That water's just spreading out over floodplain and swamp environments and uh, also the, the, the measurement of flow there is not as good as it could be given where it is. It's in the middle of really flat, low-lying area where the water just ponds. It's really, really hard to measure the water coming through there but there's no holding back of water. Thanks, Chrissy. Actually, while I've got the mic, I just wanted to ask, there's a question from Joanna, who is also online. Do the potential water restrictions in lower lakes relate to general use water or to consumption water? Do you want that question repeated? Can you repeat it, please, Di? Do the potential water restrictions in the lower lakes relate to general use water or consumption water? I think the question might have referred to the when I mentioned um, water restrictions. That would be referring to if we had to tank water in, like an SA water source, to the Wellington East, so we weren't drawing water from the river anymore, we were providing SA water water. Um, that we would would have to pay for that. So to keep the service going, we would put in some restrictions for, you know, we wouldn't allow people to irrigate lawns. It would be for purely domestic, um, you know, washing and in-house in um, services. That would be the... So there's no, no water restrictions from the river. Thank you. Di, you had a question over there? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, just because we've got live stream... Can I get you to use the mic? Thank you. Um, no, I don't like it. <laughs> OK. Um, I suppose it's a comment. Um, in yesteryear, uh, the old timers tell us that Lake Albert only got into trouble in the, in the 56 flood um, when, when the wind uh, changed and pushed the water into Lake Albert. Now, that was back then in 56, and I think our biggest enemy is not going to be the water so much, but as the wind, as uh, Gary, I think, indicated and other speakers indicated. We've had, why haven't, why haven't we put, you know, open barrages? Why haven't we this? Why haven't we that? But the wind is the big, big, big dominator in all of this, so thank you. And bear in mind, I think that's, that will help with a lot of fear that's out there at the moment. Thank you. Any more questions? You're all quiet. Oh, there's one more. We have a pump down on the lake side that we share with other people in our water company. Um, and we have dairy farms that way. How much notice would we have about our power being cut off to our pump? I know that's a strange question, but... Would it just be if it's a really windy day and it looks like that's going to be inundated with water, would it get cut off? Do we need to start putting mains back on or whatever now? Yeah, Thank with, you. With the uh, modelling we do, with the information we get from the response meetings on Thursdays, so the aim there is to give five days notice where we can. Um, so if information's coming from modelling and it's, and it's preemptive disconnections, and we try to give as much information, much notice as we can, much time. Um, if it's if it's a, a risk that is a safety risk that has to be action right, then, then it, obviously the the uh, notification time is much less. But as we hear down here, it's a lower risk, so that that should be from the from the modelling um, rather than the than the the actual risk of the day sort of thing. If that makes sense, it will come from other authorities modelling and our modelling. Um, to, to come up with that decision for, for disconnection. Fiona? Fiona, we have a question here. Um, from a primary production perspective with your dairy, um, 
South Australian Dairy Association are working really closely with everybody. So if you think or want to know more around any risks that you might have, give them a call and they will actually have a chat with everything and keep you informed of what they're learning as they're learning it. Vicky? Hi, all my questions were basically answered, but I'd just like the lady to elaborate a little bit more. Um, I'm very concerned about the Blackwater events and that we're probably going to have about three of them. And um, I know because we're at the bottom of the river system and I know because of the amount of um, fish that are in the area, this is going to be huge. Are you going to have the capacity to do the clean up? <laughs> okay. Yeah, the clean up. All right. Uh, I'll just start with talking about the blackwater risks uh, first, and then we'll talk about cleaning up fish. Um, we there has been some really, and actually I'll, I'll provide a distinction: hypoxic blackwater. So the um, uh, these floods have been really, really large upstream. They inundate the floodplain. There's a lot of leaf litter, organic matter on those floodplains that may not have been inundated for, you know five, 10, 20 years, when the, the floodwaters recede, pulls all that organic matter back into the river and all the little microbes and organisms munch it up and suck all the oxygen out of the water in doing so. And that's called hypoxic black water. Um, we have seen some really dirty coloured water come down the, down the river in the last few weeks, not necessarily hypoxic. So hypoxic black water is a particular thing. Um, generally, the dissolved oxygen in the river is around I don't know, seven to 10, uh, I'm gonna say milligrams per liter, uh, seven to 10. Met metric should be, I think it's that. Um, if it gets below four, uh, fish start to get stressed, and below two, they get very stressed and start to die. The, um, the fish that are most at risk are your large bodied native fish, so the Murray cod tend to turn belly up. Things like um, yabbies and stuff will crawl out of the water. Uh, we saw a pretty bad black water event in 2016. I was talking to one of the fish scientists just last week, and they said, you know, up to like 25% of some of those cod and things died, um, particularly the older ones, uh, because of that low dissolved oxygen coming through. A lot, it's not all of them, though. They do, we think they find places to hang out in backwaters and things like that. Um, but they, they will, quite likely there will be, at some point in time, a blackwater event coming over the border. We are taking some steps to try to mitigate that with Lake Victoria. Uh, that's a, it's a water storage just upstream of the border. At the moment, there's good there was there is good quality water in there. It's pretty flat, the inlet and the outlet to it. As we start to get some poorer water come towards it, we, we shut off the inlet, hoping that if there's some fish inside hanging out in there, or the fish in the river could could swim into it and use it as a refuge, or we can release better quality better quality water in that area into the outlet creek, so that there's at least a a better quality uh, haven for fish to go to. Mind you, given the amount of water coming down, if it's like you know, 160, 200 gig a day, our outlet capacity of Lake Victoria is at most 10, probably less with all the tailwater levels being so high, we can probably do this much difference. Like our options for mitigating black water are not very good. Um, we're kind of tinkering around the edges. And once it gets further down the river, we just don't have any tools to use. Um, We've spoken at length to fish scientists about aerators and things like that. It's very localised, if any, impact in actually improving the oxygen in the water. So it is... But in saying that, blackwood is a natural event. So it happened in the rivers well before we came along and started building dams and things like that. So it has negative fish kills, but also it brings a lot of carbon into the, the, the channel, into the main river channel. It provides an important part of the... the um, the food cycle for a lot of uh, organisms uh, and, and in the river. So it is overall uh, these flooding events, even though they do bring carbon into the river, that's an important part of that, that ecological cycle. Um, but yeah, the downside is, is that there could be fish kills and we are quite, we are expecting that to occur at some point. Actually, the great thing about these community meetings is every time you go to a different one, you learn something else, which is really, really cool. Um, look, we, we started working on how we were going to do a fish, fish clean-ups probably about four weeks ago. So uh, we actually have been working closely with 
uh, the Department of Environment and Water in identifying what the probability and what things could look like. We've also been monitoring upstream and obviously we've We've probably all seen the, the horrendous sights of the cod that have gone belly up in the Rufus and a, and a few other places. So one of the things that we have done is we also understand that with river access, some of our fishers might not be able to get out and do what they normally do. So one of the things we have done with primary industries is actually contact the local fishermen to try and see who might be available to support cleanups moving forward. We've then realised that you've got to get rid of fish and... Um, Unfortunately, I didn't see what happened here in 74, but I did see what happened here in the millennial drought, and there potentially could be a lot of fish. So we're working with um, a number of um, organisations, including Pete's, who have um, Pete Soils, who have a couple of options for um, that um, getting rid of composting um, and even some on-site options. So while um, until we know the event and until we know the magnitude, it will be different levels of, of intervention. But if um, you are a local fisher or you've got all that equipment and you haven't been contacted by someone from uh, Saudi or fisheries, uh, come and grab my card too, because we really want everybody on board if, there's at all, if it's at all possible. Because getting the equipment, the right equipment to actually do the clean up is probably half, well, it is half the problem. Some more questions? Looks like you all want to go home. Um, if there's no more questions, <laughs> if there's no more questions, I'd encourage you when you leave to take brochures. We've got a lot of brochures, got a lot of information out there. You've got a lot of information tonight. If you've got any questions, put them up on the board if we haven't answered them with post-it notes. Um, the SAGov website sa.gov.au is a fantastic website with so much information on it, which is links to all the other agencies. So it's a great website to have a look at. Think about taking brochures with people who may not be here, friends, family. We've also live streamed, so this uh, will be available later. I would also like to thank our guest speakers tonight. So we've got um, Steph, we've had Chrissy, Matt, Tony, Barb, Trevor, and Gary, also the local member and the council. We've also got some people here from SAPOL, SAS, and we've also got local SES members. So once we've finished up here, um, if you'd like to hang around and ask any questions you have. Um, we also need, just want to remind people to think about their mental health. We've talked about a lot of physical things that you can actually do, but thinking about um, things that might be happening, thinking about talking about contacting your GP if you're feeling overwhelmed or concerned about something because that is very important. It's physical things you can do but there's other things you can do. So thank you everyone for coming out. It's been a hot night. I'm sorry we started late but we've got over that and once again, thank you once again.